Hello Brighouse High School and welcome to this lesson focusing on the muscular system in sport. This lesson is quite complex and a little bit lengthier than previous ones but it is important that you do pay attention all the way throughout because we'd like to achieve three things today. Ideally we're going to be looking at identifying the type, the name and the location of all major muscles in the body. We're then going to look at how muscles work together in something called antagonistic pairs. And then we're lastly going to investigate the three muscle fibre types and how they're used effectively in sport. So, first and foremost, looking at the different types of muscle in the body. There are three types of muscle located in the body. The first one is known as the cardiac muscle, and this is located in one place, which is in the walls of the heart. The second type of muscle is known as involuntary, and this is located in places such as the intestine and blood vessels. And lastly, we're going to be looking at voluntary muscle. And these are the muscles that you will be more familiar with, such as the bicep, tricep, pectorals, etc. So a quick overview of cardiac and involuntary. So as we said, the cardiac muscle is only found in the walls of the heart. And as such, you have no conscious control of this. This muscle works automatically without you thinking about it. And it provides a constant and rhythmic pumping action which allows the blood to be pumped out of the heart and distributed to the rest of the body. And this is the muscle that you can feel working if you just place your hand on your chest where your heart is located. Involuntary muscle, again, as we've said, is found in various places, such as the walls of blood vessels, so arteries and veins and capillaries. It's also in the digestive system and located in the bladder as well. Equally, there's no conscious control over this, so you don't control how it's used. And it assists the body in many different things, such as controlling blood flow, digesting food and removing waste products. And the little animation that you can see on the screen now is just a basic representation of what happens when food is eaten and how the muscles in that digestive system push that food through the process until it becomes a waste product. Now, voluntary muscle, also known as skeletal muscle, is what we're going to focus most of our attention on. And this is the muscle that you have full conscious control over and you decide how and when to use these muscles. In previous lessons, we've heard the word tendons, so we're just going to recap them. So tendons are the fibrous material that attaches muscle to bone. They produce all conscious movement in the body. And that's including day-to-day -day things like brushing your teeth or having your cereal up to the more advanced movements required for sport and physical activity. And one thing that's going to be referred to throughout this presentation is the fact that muscles can only pull. Muscles do not push, they only ever pull. And that's going to be very important to remember. So, first little task that we have for you here. As you can see, we have uh, two images of the muscular system, both front and back. Where the arrows are located, these are the major muscles that you need to know the names of. So what I would like you to do, independently, I would like you to see if you could list as many names of the major muscles that you know. Pause the video now. Okay, welcome back. So, let's see how well you did on that task, seeing if you got the names correct. So, starting in the top left hand corner, that muscle on the outside of the shoulder is known as the deltoid. Two large muscles across the chest are known as pectorals. Front of the upper arm we have the bicep. Located in the stomach area we have the abdominals. Just underneath the rib cage and on the side of the abdominals we have the external obliques. Located towards the top of the leg we have the hip flexor. Front of the upper leg we have the quadricep. And then front of the lower leg, we have the tibialis anterior. Back of the lower leg, we have the gastrocnemius. Back of the upper leg, we have the hamstring. Located in the bum area, we have the gluteus maximus. On either side of the back, we have the latissimus dorsi. Back of the upper arm, we have the tricep. And lastly, Starting at the neck and going down towards the vertebral column, we have the trapezius. It's important to understand that you must be 
using the correct terminology for muscles rather than their uh, more favoured names that you would see outside of GCSEP. So, for example, the gastrocnemius is the preferred name rather than the calf. And equally, abbreviations will not be accepted. So things like abs and pecs are pectoral and abdominals. So now we know the names and the location of the muscles, it's important to know what movement they create when they contract or they pull. A lot of the words that we've used in the movement you'll be familiar with from our joint presentation. So the deltoids located in the shoulder area, these allow abduction of the shoulder, so moving the shoulder and the arm away from the body. And a good sporting example of this is this, which is known as the Maltese cross on the gymnastics rings. The pectorals, located at the front of the chest, these allow adduction of the shoulder. So when you are catching a basketball or a netball and you bring your arms into your chest, the pectorals allow you to do that. Bicep allows flexion at the elbow, so bending of the arm. Something like serving in table tennis would be a good example of this. The external obliques located on the outside of the abdominals down either side of the body. These allow you to rotate your trunk. So breathing in swimming when you're doing front crawl, that would be a good example. The abdominals allow you to bring the upper body forward. So something like a sit-up is again a good sporting example for this. The hip flexor allows flexion of the hip, which means bringing the knee up to the chest. So doing hurdles, for example, is a perfect example. The quadricep allows you to straighten your leg, which is known as extension of the knee. So a slide tackle in football is a good example there. The hamstring does the opposite to that, so it bends the leg, which is flexion of the knee. The tibialis anterior on the front of the lower leg allows you to perform dorsiflexion. So again, controlling a football like you see in the image is a good example of this. And the gastrocnemius does the opposite. This allows plantar flexion of the ankle. So when that we push off on a running... Uh, running event, plantar flexion is created and it's the gastrocnemius that allows that to happen. The gluteus maximus, so this is the large muscle in the bum, this allows extension of the hip, so moving the leg backwards at the hip. It's very important that you don't get this confused with flexion of the knee. This is the leg moving backwards at the hip. So in this example, if you look at the player's right leg, the leg he's about to kick the ball with, his gluteus maximum is pulling his hip backwards to generate that force when it comes forward. The latissimus dorsi, located in the back, these allow adduction of the shoulders. So they bring the shoulders or the arms back down towards the body. A good example of this is on the gymnastic bars. The tricep straightens the arm, so extension at the elbow. A great example in that image there of javelin. And lastly, the trapezius, just located on left and right of the neck going down to the back, allows abduction of the shoulder. So when you're performing shot put and you're driving that shot put away from the body, the trapezius allows that to happen. So, now we know the name, the location, and the type of movement that those muscles create, we're gonna look at muscles working together in pairs. Now, as we've said before, muscles only produce a pulling action. They never ever push. Therefore, they need to work together. Because when one muscle pulls, their partner muscle must be ready to pull the limb in the opposite direction to get back to the original position. When muscles work together, they're known as antagonistic pairs. Within that pair, you will have one muscle producing the movement, and we refer to that as the agonist. And the muscle that is relaxing is known as the antagonist. To give you an example, if we look at this dumbbell curl here, to get the dumbbell from a position where it's at number one and you bring it up to number two position, the agonist muscle is the bicep because it is contracting and it's pulling the ulna and radius upwards. At the same time, the tricep on the back of the arm is relaxing and therefore it's known as the antagonist. However, to get it back down to where we want it to be, they then change roles. The tricep becomes the agonist because the tricep contracts and it pulls the ulnar radius back down to its original position. And in order to do that, the bicep must relax. So that automatically becomes the antagonist. 
This can be quite complex to understand, so we're going to go through a few more of the uh, examples in the body. If you want to give it a go yourself, you can. You're welcome to pause the video now and try and identify which two muscles work together to produce movement. If not, continue to watch the video and I'll go through with it now. So, starting at the top of the body here, the deltoid and the trapezius often work together, and then the latissimus dorsi is the one that produces the opposite movement. So, the deltoid and trapezius allow the shoulder to abduct, move away from the body, and the latissimus dorsi will adduct that limb back to the body. Bicep and tricep we've already talked about, so the bicep allows flexion, the tricep brings that back down through extension. The hip flexor and gluteus maximus, so again the hip flexor allows the leg or the hip to flex or come forward, bringing the knee up to the chest, whereas the gluteus maximus does the opposite, it will bring the leg back down or even pull it backwards. The quadricep and the hamstring, so the quadricep allows the leg to extend, extension of the knee, and the hamstring allows flexion of the knee. And here we are, tibialis anterior. So the tibialis anterior allows plantar flexion, a uh, dorsiflexion, sorry, and the gastric nemius allows plantar flexion. So let's look at analysing what we've just learned, see if we can apply it to this spotting image here. I've given you an example looking at the athlete's right ankle, and I want to see if you can do the other three stars. So for example, in the right ankle, plantar flexion is occurring because the gastric nemius is contracted, making the toe point downwards, and the tibialis anterior is relaxing, meaning it's the antagonist. Pause the video now and see if you can do the right hip, the left knee, and the right elbow. Okay, let's see how well you did. So, abduction of the right leg at the hip is caused by the gluteus maximus contracting, making it the agonist, and the hip flexor relaxing, making it the antagonist. On the left knee, as you can see, the leg is bent, which is known as flexion. That's caused by the hamstring contracting and the quadricep relaxing. And lastly, we have the right arm bent, which again we know as flexion, and that's caused by the bicep contracting and the tricep relaxing. So, we're now going to look at muscle fibre types within skeletal muscle. So only talking about voluntary muscle now, your bicep, your tricep, abdominals, all those different ones that we've just learnt the names of. These muscles are made up of thousands of individual fibres, which contract and relax to create movement. The best way to think about muscle fibres is think about any electrical cable you have in your house. It looks like it's within one solid cable, however, if you were to strip that cable back, Please don't, but if you were to strip it back, you would see inside it's made up of many, many thousands or hundreds or singular tens and twenties of fibres. These fibres are similar to what we have in muscles. So image one is the muscle cut in half. Image two is a dissection of that muscle pulled out. And image three is a further dissection. And image three is the muscle, individual muscle fibres. These muscle fibres can be categorised into three types. You have type 1, which is known as a slow twitch muscle fibre, type 2A, which is a fast twitch, and type 2X, which is also a fast twitch. So, every individual has all three muscle fibre types. We all have type 1, type 2, and type, th uh, type 2A, type 2X. But the percentage of what we have is based on either genetics, so what you were born with from your mum and dad and family members, but also the type of training and exercise that you take part in. For example, we have three different athletes here. We have Mo Farah, who's obviously an endurance runner, Usain Bolt, who is all about speed, and then we have a footballer, Kevin De Bruyne, who probably fits in between both of those. So Mo Farah, his percentage of muscle fibres would predominantly be made of type 1. Usain Bolt's muscle fibres would predominantly be type 2X and Kevin De Bruyne's muscle fibres would predominantly be type 2A. If we look at that in a little bit more detail, I'm going to show you a cross section of the different muscle fibre types. So on the left hand side here, you can see that the long distance runner has more slow twitch muscle fibres than fast twitch. 
At the opposite end, if we look at the sprinter, you can see that they have far more fast twitch than they do slow twitch. And then the middle distance runner has a relatively even distribution of both slow twitch and fast twitch. So let's look into type one. As we said, type one is categorized as a slow twitch muscle fiber. This means it's extremely well suited to endurance events. It can work for long periods of time so it doesn't fatigue quickly. It produces a low to moderate speed with gentle muscular contractions. And it's designed to work aerobically, which basically means the athlete takes the oxygen in and it's that oxygen that creates the energy. Sporting examples include a marathon runner, endurance cycling, something like the Tour de France, a triathlete where they swim, run and cycle, and even things like rowing. Type 2A is categorized as a fast twitch muscle fibre. Now this is suited to sports that require frequent bursts of energy, but these sports might go on for a long period of time, like a football game that goes on for 90 minutes. Within that 90 minutes, you might have to do frequent sprints, tackles, so you need that high burst of energy. These muscle fibers don't work for a long period of time, maybe between 30 seconds to two minutes. So they, they do run out eventually, so you do need some recovery time after each time you've used them. They do contract quickly and powerfully with a high degree of force, and they're designed to work anaerobically, which means that they create their own energy using existing stores within the body. These are best suited to, to mostly games players, so footballers, netballers, rugby players, but even tennis players, where you've got to explosively serve, but the rally might go on for two minutes, five minutes, however long the game suggests. Now type 2X is also a fast twitch muscle fibre, but it's different to type 2A in that this is the most powerful form of fast twitch. It contracts extremely quickly and produces the highest amount of force out of all muscle fibres. So explosive actions take place when you use fast twitch type 2X. They only work for a very short period of time, less than 10 seconds of, uh, a lot of time, and they fatigue very quickly. Again, similar to type 2A, they work anaerobically. So they don't use oxygen that you breathe in. They use existing stores within the muscles, but they can create lactic acid. And lactic acid is a chemical which causes muscles to become sore or can even cramp up. Type 2X is commonly associated with explosive sports such as sprinting, shot put, Olympic platform diving, uh, a long jump or triple jump. Anything that lasts a very short period of time and that requires the athlete to produce maximum force in a very, very short period of time. So, let's see if you now know more and remember more. If I gave you this diagram, could you name, correctly spell and locate all the major muscles of the body? Could you finish this table off showing all the different muscles, the movement that they allow, and give me a sporting example. And could you analyze this image here to determine three different types of muscle fibers, explain the characteristics of each, and discuss which fibers are best suited to which athletes. Hopefully you can. I appreciate this video has gone on a lot longer than the others, but this is quite a long and lengthy complex topic, and it's important you understand them. Please go back through it, make sure that you are familiar with all the different areas so that when Miss Heppenstall does release the task, you are ready to go on with it and perform well. Thank you very much for listening, stay safe and hopefully we'll see you shortly. Bye bye.